Welcome to the latest episode of the Five Reasons Podcast. I'm Ethan Skolnick here as always and earlier than usual with Chris Whittingham. Now that you have found us, make sure that you hit the subscribe or follow button on your favorite podcast provider. That way you get all of our old episodes as well as all of our new episodes. And again, if you have a favorite, uh, you will probably find us. We're also on Spotify now. We're on TuneIn. So we've been added to a bunch of other places. Doesn't matter to us where you listen to us. Just find whatever is comfortable for you. Also, check out the other 14 podcasts in our network. That's right. We have 14, including our newest ones, which are out for the count on boxing and MMA, and also the Chamber podcast, which is performance, lifestyle, and fitness that's hosted by receiver, former receiver, Chris Chambers. And also a cool factoid here found this morning. We've now had the t- five top receivers in Dolphins history by yardage and receptions on our podcast, and two of them O.J. McDuffie and Chris Chambers are hosts, and you can find the top one, Mark Duper, on the latest episode of The Fish Tank. They had Mark Clayton, who's number two, last week. But we're going to transition back to the heat. All of us were up late last night. We've got Christian Hernandez from Miami Heat Beat with us. You can find us, find him at the Maple Rick on Twitter. He's our, our well, I was going to say you are a resident nerd, um, but I, but I, but I work with Whittingham. So, I, so I, I figure the way that this podcast is going to work out here is just like me saying, Hey, fourth quarter situations, clutch, you know, three minutes left deficit of five or less Christian Chris go. So that, that's pretty much the way I think this is going to work out. And you guys are just going to spit a bunch of numbers at me and Alf from Miami heat beats going to get really upset. Uh, but it should be fun. Christian, thanks for joining us. No, thank you guys. And uh, I got no problem with calling me a nerd. There's all kinds of nerds. I'm sure Chris is a slightly different kind of nerd than I am. <laughs> <laughs> They're all different. Ki- all Nerds come in shape, all different shapes and sizes, don't they? Uh, yes. <laughs> they, they, all, they all talk a lot and say a lot of numbers. And, and I like being, because I've been considered a nerd at times, of course, in my career. After all, my last name is Skolnick. Have you ever seen that movie? Um, but uh, I like being the least nerdy one on a podcast for a change, uh, completely out of, out of three. All right, so let's get to it. Um, and let's get to last night first, because uh, all of us stayed up to watch it, which was the last dance between Wade and LeBron out in Los Angeles felt a little weird to me just it being there, um, you know, because there's just no history there uh, for the two of them. But I think we got the game we wanted, actually. Um, I mean, the Heat played well. The kids played well, which or at least two of them did, which is kind of what we've been asking for. And Wade had a chance at the end and he got picked up by LeBron at the end and ended up forcing a shot. But, you know, they ended up getting into it and having some fun afterwards. Uh, what did you make? Uh, I'll start with you, Christian. What did you just make of the Heat's overall performance last night, particularly Wade's performance? Um, I mean, I, I thought he had a great game, apart from the fact that it seemed like he couldn't hit any of his jumpers. Um, you could tell right from the start, right when he checked in, that he was very engaged in the game, um, you know, for obvious reasons, you know, there are times this season that Dwayne has not always looked totally engaged. He looked a hundred percent engaged last night. Um, he might have not, not always gotten the results he wanted, but I mean, he looked great. He had 10 assists. I don't think he's done that this season. Um, he was sharp. It's just, it's a, it's a bummer that his jump shot was just pretty off last night. Right. And I think that's one of the things that has come with new Dwayne Wade and the number of threes that he's taken. It's actually quite remarkable. Averaging four and a half attempts per game, but last night goes 0 for 7, like when it doesn't look like he wants to, which by the way, th- that number of three-point attempts is by far the most in his career. An uh, 08 09, he averaged three and a half attempts a game, um, but it, in this sort of recent period, it's mostly been around two, two and a half, and, and at, at times low as half a three a game uh, during the big three era, so uh, he's become a three-point shooter now, and he's shooting them at a fairly decent clip. He's 35%, which is around league average, and last night, they just didn't go in for him and I think it's kind of interesting because I may or may not have not stayed up for the full duration of the game and so I I woke up this morning and I saw uh, you know of his shot selection in the final two minutes uh he missed three shots and two of them were threes and I'm just kind of fascinated by the idea that Dwayne Wade is now reliably taking threes even if he doesn't make them he was five for ten against the Clippers with those threes but you mentioned the 10 assists he's holding up his end it's just I I think uh, and we're going to get to this quite a bit that the starting lineup right now for the Heat is probably the 
the wrong one. And when they start games that way, they kind of dig in themselves holes, aren't they? Yeah, they do every game. And I just want to go through his numbers a little bit here because just to put into some context, you know, the way he's played this year, like if anybody had any concerns about him embarrassing himself this season, that has not happened. And it's it's not going to happen. Um, I mean, you look at his per 36, he's averaging 20.6 points, five, five rebounds, 5.5 assists per 36. I mean, his turnovers are about where they've been over the course of his career. You mentioned he's 30, shooting 35% from three, but his numbers with the exception of the three ball are really comparable per minute to where they were his last full season with the heat 2015, 16. Like I, it's, it was until a couple of days ago, it was almost a carbon copy. And, and I don't think we anticipated that. And not just because of the age, but Chris and I talked about this on the pod because he didn't know if he was playing this season. So I thought, to a certain degree, he would not train himself, whether mentally or physically, the way he has in some past seasons. But, I mean, it looks virtually the same to me with the exception um, of the three-point shot. I want to get to LeBron real quick here uh, before we move on to all Heat stuff. When you watch him play now, Christian, is there something he's doing that's different than before to sort of adjust for his age? Yeah, he's become almost casually a great shooter. Um, I mean, last night, there were times when, especially uh, towards the end of the game, they had Derek Jones Jr. defending LeBron. Um, and I noticed that he seemed totally content to just settle for that jump shot. It's not even that I think that he didn't want to drive because he did at the, towards the end of the game. He got to the rim and drew a foul. But he looks really comfortable taking jumpers. Um, the jumper used to be more of like, you know, kind of keeping teams in check because you knew ultimately he wanted to get to the rim. I think as he's getting older, he's settling more for that jumper, but it's become a legitimate weapon for him. Yeah, and, and shooting at a high percentage as well. And I, again, another player who I think is taking uh, more threes than he has over the course of his career. You look at him during the big three era, you mentioned how he used that three kind of as maybe an efficiency tool and maybe something to keep defenders honest. But he's averaging six threes a game now. And you look at his first year in the big three era, it was two and a half. So he, he is uh, taking more outside jump shots, which is probably good for him. Obviously, I, I, I remember, and Ethan, I'm sure you remember this uh, because of the number of tropes that happened during the the big three era that anytime things went wrong all the fans were shouting just go inside LeBron and get a layup but now I think like you said Christian he's using that three much more to his advantage and I think uh, probably has to adjust more for the different team that he's playing with in terms of the different skill sets that surround him now I feel like there was a model that was built around him which is LeBron and shooters and now that that's not really a thing for him he's had to adjust a little bit and I feel like it's kind of made some elements of his game shine but I, I do think overall he's been basically the same player look at his numbers he's been rough the, the only thing that's a little bit down are his assists and I wonder if he's still and I, I can look this up if he's still creating the same number of assist opportunities but mm -hmm. there just isn't enough shooting on the team to take advantage of it but I, I think LeBron is the same he ever was with well, the exception I, of taking more jump shots right no I think that's possible I also think I think watching last night it, he seems to have a desire to have Lonzo handle a little bit more than he's had other guys handle and that, and that might be creating some of that I you know to me I, I look at the West right now and I was not big on the Lakers offseason acquisitions and kind of the placeholders that they put in there but the reality is that conference is there for the taking with the exception of Golden State like I mean that two seed is available <laughs> I mean you you look at you know the teams that have played well so far Denver's going to lose Millsap for a few weeks now um, I don't really trust OKC, Houston 13th or 14th, Houston and, and Utah sinking to the bottom of the conference. Those were the two teams that I thought could challenge Golden State, at least, you know, for part of the season hasn't really happened. So there is an opportunity for LeBron. And I mean, just in reality, he's off to, you know, a better start than he was off to in Cleveland his first year back there when he went 19 and 20. And, and we all know what happened with the Heat, went 9 and 8 before ripping off 21 to 22. But I, I, I agree with you guys. It does look like he's more comfortable with the jumper, which sort of makes it impossible uh, to play him. I think people thought that his adjustment as he got older would be the post. I think that's what the Heat thought, too. That's what they were trying to do with him. But it seems like instead of going inside, he's gone more outside. One thing before we get back to the numbers, I just want to comment on the sort of the spectacle of last night with Wade and LeBron and kind of what I was thinking was, you know, what would this have looked like if LeBron had never left? Like if, if LeBron doesn't leave in 2014, let's say he trusts Pat 
let's say that they don't make more decisions like Danny Granger and Josh McRoberts <laughs> and, and, and amnesties and not letting LeBron's you know, friends hang out where they wanted to hang out and all the things that went into that. Let's say that he stays. How do you guys think that would have looked for the two of them as, as Wade aged? And now we know that we thought Wade was broken four years ago. I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't play in the finals games, you know, without wincing. And he clearly resurrected his career to a certain degree and adjusted to be able to play at a high level at 36. What do you guys think it would have looked like together? I almost don't think I, – I really think that a lot of those things that were happening might have continued. Like, if, if Dwayne Wade was still playing next to LeBron James and was basically saving himself for the finals every year, I think, I think Dwayne Wade might have continued to be on a maintenance plan. And I, I just do think that there might have needed to be a clean break for a lot of these things to go and happen. I will say, though, I, I think the one thing you're getting at is if these guys were together for nine years – and then Dwayne Wade is on a retirement tour, then I think it really does kind of add to the – like it, it is viewed through the specter of those two players and, and, and the career that they had together as opposed to LeBron James and Dwayne Wade are best friends and they're playing for the final time. By the, by the way, I'm a little bit bummed out that the schedule had it so that these two teams met uh, you know, twice before New Year's Day mm -hmm. instead of having this towards the end of the year. I feel like it would have been much cooler as the retirement tour is wrapping up for the Lakers to be either in town in March or the, the, the Heat go to L.A. in March. But you're right. I, I feel like there's a sense of it that's obviously it's about these two guys and the relationship they have uh, last night, but there is really no context with – uh, their teams, right? Because even Dwayne Wade on the Heat, a lot of the players that played with LeBron James are no longer here. And obviously, LeBron James, his first year in Los Angeles, there isn't really there wasn't really the setting in the grand scheme for this thing to happen, other than these two guys have this spectacular relationship that's unique in NBA history. I mean, the only thing that I could think that would be that would be interesting if that scenario had happened is especially if they had won more championships. Like, let's mm -hmm. say that team actually did end up beating, you know, the, the Warriors, let's say, at least one year and just kind of further cementing, like, the legacy that they had together. I think it would add more meaning to a retirement, especially, like, if the scenario had been if he had stayed in Miami through the four years that he went back to Cleveland and then went to L.A., I think a game like that last night would have had even more meaning than it already did. Yeah, I don't know if he ever – that's the other question. I, I, if he doesn't go to Cleveland then, I think he stays in Miami for the long haul until one year in Cleveland at the very end. In other words, I don't know that the Lakers scenario ever really happens because that kind of got into the picture when he got really tired of Dan Gilbert again and wasn't going to play for him anymore. And then he had a lot of people, obviously, he works with, Maverick and others, who wanted to do business in L.A. And so the whole thing kind of came together with them having the space to do it. I think if he stays in Miami, I think it's one trip to Cleveland, basically. He goes there at the very end. He was always going to do that. Maybe they, he, you know, maybe he tries to get in position to draft his son, although he would have to sit out an entire season probably to do that if his son is high enough on the draft boards. But I don't know that 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 ever occurs. I just, I wonder what Dwayne's growth uh, would have looked like, because I, I do think the thing you're right about uh, Chris is that, I mean, that thing had it started to get tired in the fourth year because LeBron was tired of Dwayne not playing. And I, I don't know where Dwayne takes his body. If he doesn't, have to go to Chicago and try to prove himself again and all the rest of that. Or, or frankly, or frankly, for me, like if he just if he had, didn't have a six month off season, like I feel like right. he just needed one of those so badly. And if LeBron's here, they're at least getting to the Eastern right. Finals every year. So I, I I don't know if if Dwayne ever really gets his body in a position where he's healthy, like fully healthy and not needing you know to basically have WD forty squeezed on it before the beginning of every game. Yeah, and, and here's the thing: they probably don't people will say oh what would they have looked like with Winslow and Richardson and out of bio they don't end up with those right guys. yeah you don't get the you don't get the 10th pick with LeBron James that doesn't happen <laughs> right. well you might have gotten Richardson I will say this if you'd true, had a second true. round pick you might have gotten Richardson but the other two you weren't getting now of course as we had you know Tim Hardaway on our podcast they should have had Draymond Green well uh, and, and right and, and that, that would have looked a little bit differently if they had just listened to Timmy but uh when they had that that spot but anyway interesting to think about because I I, I do I do wonder what Dwayne would have been. It's just what's fascinating to me about Dwayne more than anything else is we don't talk about the knee anymore. We spent three years of the big three era talking about the bruises in his knee, right? And 
we don't talk about any of that stuff anymore. And, and like, we don't talk about him missing back to backs. We don't talk no. about him. Well, do, do you think he can do it physically over 82 games? Like the fact that that got better with age, like it is incredibly bizarre. Another of the great sponsors of the five reasons sports network. And that's the seltzer Mayberg attorneys. One of our new sponsors. You can find them at one call legal.com. That's one call legal.com or call one eight, five, five, 5,000 law. They handle cases including, but not limited to, car accidents, slip and falls, criminal immigration, family bankruptcy, real estate, wills, trusts, and estates. And they've got a new 15,000 square foot office that's opening on I-95 in North Miami, right in the heart of everything. They'll handle cases from all over the state, Pensacola, all the way down to the Keys. Call now with 24-7 service for a free consultation. That's onecalllegal.com. One eight five 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 thousand law. All right, so let's move back to some of the numbers on this stuff, and let's move to what to me was the highlight of of yesterday's game, and has been the highlight of the last three games. Just going to throw this out to you guys with no context whatsoever. Last three games, Justice Winslow sixty nine points. Last three games, Devin Booker zero. Oh come on, <laughs> what are you doing? That is just ridiculous. <laughs> I don't get a. I don't get a nice. I don't even get a nice. No, uh, you, you just get you just get derision from me. What are you doing? Uh, right. <laughs> I definitely came on the right show. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Sixty-nine to nothing. So I mean, we can safely say they made the right choice. Correct, Justice Better. Why is this happening, Christian? What What are you seeing? Uh, why has Justice broken out the way he's broken out the last three games? I don't have a good explanation for you. I really don't. I've been thinking about it, especially after last night's game ended where we just have, you know, one more game of of this new version of Justice Winslow that, you know, we've definitely never seen before. Um, I just ran it real quick because um, I, I, was, I was curious about this, and it, it's actually even better than I thought. The last three games on this road trip uh, where a particular player has not been with the team – Justice Winslow is 11 of 12 inside the restricted area. That's 92%. If you've been following my Twitter account at all, I've been tracking constantly this season that he is still really struggling to finish around the rim. And that is by far the biggest thing that will unlock his game moving forward is if he can just finish at a league average or above rate around the rim with the ease at which he gets to it. I mean, that's going to open up a lot of things, um, especially now the teams are starting to respect his jump shot. Yeah, and, and that for me is the most important thing. Uh, it's sort of in that vein, I looked up uh, sort of whether or not he, he's driving to the rim more. He's averaging about six drives a game over these last three and shooting at a 60% clip. So, yeah, I, to me, it is all about his finishing near the rim. And by the way, in the Laker game, it was also outside shooting. Six of ten from three was four for four from three against Phoenix as well uh, in the month of December, which I'll be at is only five games of shooting 52% on five and a half attempts a game. But the rest of the year, you look at uh, you look at in uh, in November, it was 33% on three attempts a game. So if he's going to have an outburst in three-point shooting, taking more and making more, then yeah, obviously he's going to open up. But it's still kind of funny to me that uh, even with all of this, on the season it's still 40% from the field and 39% from three, 70% from the line, 11 points a game. That's still, as you said, uh, Christian, roughly a league average player. So I, I think he's got a lot more to prove in terms of showing this. Eric Reed kept highlighting last night how infrequent 20-point games have been over the course of his career. And so I I'm not going to trust that you know what's happened these last three games is an indication of what he's going to be or rather just three very good games that he's having but I do think that a lot of what's happened with the team uh, particularly with Justice and with Bam Adebayo had, can be pretty directly linked to what's happening with Hassan Whiteside not being in the game and if Hassan Whiteside is detracting from uh, from the skills of some of the other players just by virtue not not anything in particular that's corrosive about his personality or about his game but just by the positions that he takes and that because Bam can be 18 feet from the rim on any given play and that's not where Hassan wants to play it does seem to open things up for for a few more players and I think Justice might be one of them yeah, I want to hit on Hassan more um, in the next section, but just going back to justice on a couple of things. First, I, I find it interesting that 
what's developed as sort of the kink in his game is not the shooting. It's been the finishing because that was not the narrative for the first like year and a half. Right. It was justice can't shoot. Justice can shoot. Like, I mean, his shooting from the outside is fine. He was fine as a three point shooter last year, not on big volume, but he was fine. He made a big jump from the first two seasons. And again, the second season is a washout. So I don't even count that one. And my my thing on justice is this two things. One, I don't understand this market. I've tweeted this many times that has been looking for growth from 30 year old Ryan Tannehill, but has given up on Justice Winslow at 22. OK, I just that one. I, I don't I don't get it. All right. At, at all. All right. I, I don't understand you know, why there was this rush to judgment on justice when he played one season as a core rotation player on a Good team, a team that got within a game of the Eastern Conference Finals. He was an important player who played a lot of minutes, who, as we remember, was trusted at the five because they had no other options in the last game against Toronto. And then he has a washout second season and what is a completely weird year. All right. And then, you know, and then last year makes progress with his three point shot. And everybody's like, OK, bust us. And, and I, I don't know where that came from. I, to me, the worst you could say about him is kind of what Chris has been saying, which is I view him as a high-level role player potentially. Okay, I, I, I can buy that. Maybe you don't think he's he eventually has the skill set to be a lead guy. But I'll tell you this. In watching him and watching Josh Richardson, Josh Richardson to me is a more skilled player at this point. He's also three years older. But Justice has the alpha thing. I don't think Josh has the alpha thing. And I think part of what's been difficult this season has been the heat. And I understand it, but they're trying to justify the Butler situation, right? Like not wanting to put Jay Rich into a lot of those trades. And so they needed to force feed somebody as their lead guy. They felt Josh was more ready to do it. And so they've had him do it. But to me, he's he's Eddie Jones in every way. He's Eddie Jones skill set. He's Eddie Jones build. And he's also Eddie Jones's personality. And that's not a bad thing, but Eddie was always, and I covered all of his seasons here was always more comfortable as a two or a three than he was as a one. And when he had to be the one in the 2001, 2000, oh, excuse me, 2002, 2003 season, they lost 57 games. OK, not Eddie's fault, but just not his personality. And his numbers were very similar to what Jay Rich has put up. So let me throw that one back at you guys. If I was to say one of the two of them is going to be your, I don't know, second best player, because I still feel like they need a star. OK, as their one, which of the two of them do you think is more likely to be that? I mean, um, I guess I, I feel a little bit better now. Um, and I didn't like really tell anybody this, but but after the season ended last season, especially with the way that that series went against the Sixers, I kind of asked myself that same question. And my gut kind of, my gut thought that justice still had more potential down the line. And it was because of a lot of the reasons that he showed in that Philadelphia series. He was much more assertive. He was much more confident. And I mean, especially in these last few weeks, you can, I don't need stats to back this up. You, you can see the difference with justice. He's not hesitating, uh, you know, on his dribble drives. He's, he always seems like he knows where he's going now. I think he's finally figuring out what his game is and what areas he can excel in. And, you know, obviously the fact that his, his shot is all of a sudden becoming a legitimate weapon is opening things up for him. But the finishing around the rim, that, that was always the thing that people were hanging their hat on that, oh, he's, he's not good because he can't finish around the rim. That, I mean, I'm no coach or I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not a scout or anything like that, but I would imagine finishing a layup is probably one of the easier things you can fix over a long period of time of practice and repetition. So it was always kind of silly to me that people thought that he was not going to get better. And considering he's 22 as well, I mean, I think that's the other thing that, Maybe we have to change how we evaluate the game a little bit is when these kids are coming in the league at 18, 19, these are raw individuals. And sometimes I don't think we appreciate the psychology behind becoming an elite athlete. But um, I think we need to give these guys more time and more patience to, to grow and really figure out what kind of player they're meant to be. 
I, I understand the impatience, though, because I think you saw, like, you're, for example, you're seeing this year with Luka Doncic in Dallas that from year one, he's ready to go and he's helping them win. Donovan Mitchell came in, and, and albeit, he, he, I believe he was longer as a college player than Justice was, but he came in and helped the team win a playoff series. And so I, I, as unrealistic as it, as it was to say, because it's the 10th pick in the draft, right? Like, you're not, you're, you're probably not going to get even a rotation caliber player with a 10th pick in the draft just based off, it, off its history. But I think a lot of people were hoping that Justice Winslow would be a core piece, not a core piece in a ro- in a rotational sense, but a core piece in a could help you be one of the three best players on a championship or a team competing for a championship kind of player. And so I think when people say Bustis or when people say that, you know, after three years, I don't think it was anywhere close to that. And I think obviously these last three games have been somewhere close to that, but on, on the balance of the season, I don't think he's still that either. Um, I, I do kind of understand that people were out on it, and frankly, I was out on it, because even though he's only 22, I just don't see a lot of players from year four, right? If if, I'm, if you're telling me, okay, it's been a season and a half and he's not there yet, that's one thing. He's in his fourth season in the NBA, and we haven't seen anything close to a player that it's a foundational piece, or like you said, can be the second best player next to a superstar and help you win between you know somewhere over fifty over fifty game over fifty games. And so I, I'm still not entirely convinced that that's ever going to happen for either of these two players. I think these are two very good players. They can probably be your fourth and your fifth best player on a championship caliber team. But I, I'm not I'm not overreacting the three games, or I'm not overreacting to the, the fact that he's 22. When you're an NBA player, you you have to show it, even from an early age. I think you're seeing a lot of players around the league showing it from 20, from 21, and that kind of should be the standard because that's when you're at your athletic peak. Even if you don't necessarily know how to play the game, which I think is what you're saying, Christian, I think Justice has learned a lot uh, this year, and I think in general when they put him in positions where he's playing a lot of minutes and figuring things out that he can grow a lot within the course of, of individual games – I'm just not entirely convinced that Justice is really anything more, m- much more than a rotational guy. I'm going to make some excuses for him, though, okay? First, um, again, the second season was a washout. Yep. Um, you know, second, a lot of rookies come in, and in their first season, they play on teams that just need them to play through mistakes. That wasn't really an option for the first year for him. Remember, he didn't even get named to the Rising Stars game, okay, even though he was playing much better than a lot of other rookies because he was playing a bench role on a good team that was trying to win. I mean, this organization is always trying to win, sometimes to their detriment, right? But that year, they thought they had a legitimate chance. And I talked to somebody pretty high up in the organization recently who was still regretting was still regretting what happened with Bosch in 1516 because they felt if they and we can say this is crazy or not okay but they felt if they could get in a series with LeBron just because of the way that he had struggled down here and because they had some elements that could work against him they had multiple defenders they had a stretch player in Bosch who was going to pull out uh, their bigs they they felt they could they could deal with uh, with their group that they, they always regret that they never got a chance to see that. So their, whatever you think of that, their mindset that year was push, 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 push. And so Justice is, from the very beginning, like had to adjust what he was doing in college where he was, you know, along with Okafor, I guess, uh, you know, one of the lead guys and was the lead guy during their Final Four run to like blending in and filling a role for 25 to 30 minutes. So he wasn't really asked to develop in that way. Then he misses his second season. All right. Then again, last year they were sort of pushing forward. I would have liked to have seen more growth for him. But I think all of those things kind of play in. And I also think the organization has really no one to do with him. Like he has a different kind of skill set. I know we compare him to Ron Artest or others have come up, but it, it has felt like they haven't really sort of understood what their role is. And look, it was Nikias, and I'm sure Spo has seen this from but Nikias on Heat Beat has been saying forever he's a point guard, but their best offensive player has been a point guard. And so it's been difficult to kind of take the ball out of his hands. I want to go through, and I want to get to that because I think Goran plays into this too. We talk a lot about Whiteside. We're going to do that. But I feel like we need to talk about what, you know, Goran wasn't absent last night, but he was kind of absent. And I I wonder how that's playing into justice. But uh, Christian, give me this. Which of these metrics, I'm just going to go to basketball reference. Which of these metrics do you prefer? Win shares per 48, BPM, or or, uh, value over replacement player? Which one should I choose here? Um. I mean, value over replacement player is based off of BPM, um, but I think I'd rather go with those uh, just because win shares can get kind of funky, especially when it comes to how it treats big men. 
Okay, so let's go through this. So in terms of BPN, this is the 2015 NBA draft, which, by the way, ain't any great shakes, okay? <laughs> uh, if you take a look at it. I mean, there's one star. <laughs> okay, there's one star. It's Carl Anthony Towns. Um, but basically, if you go by this, Josh Richardson is eighth in BPM in his draft class. He was drafted 40th. Justice was 20th when I checked this about two weeks ago, and now he's 16th. So he's moved up closer to his draft position. Now, the, the other star, and, and this has been affected by, I think, team and also by his absence this year, obviously, is Porzingis. And now he's dropped down to 12th in that, but I, clearly he's the second best player, or, or if, depending if you like him better, the best player in this draft when he's healthy. It was not a great draft. I mean, Montrez Harrell is second, okay? De DeLon Wright is third, and Larry Nance Jr. Is, is fourth. So none of them are stars. But my point on that is, I don't think it's too late to give up on Justice being one of the three or four potential stars in that draft class. If he's not Towns or Porzingis, he certainly can be better than Kevin Looney. He can be better than I think he'd be better than Miles Turner, okay, who has been one of the better guys. He can be better than Cauley Stein. I, I just again to be out on him because he was the tenth pick. You have to look at the context of the draft. Like, there's a lot of guys drafted ahead of us. Uh, I almost said it. I almost said it. See what you guys have done to me? I, there's a lot of guys drafted ahead of Justice that have not performed as well as Justice, um, you know, including his college teammate who, you know, is is Okafor in the league anymore? Did, did anybody sign him? I don't think uh, so. I believe he's riding the end of the bench somewhere. I think I saw him on a box score the other day. He's on the Pelicans. I thought you were going to say you saw him on a bus, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> he's... he's uh, he's, he's on the Pelicans. He's played 13 games and is like played five right. and a half minutes in the right. games. Right. So, so like, are, are, are we, I mean, is Justice better than Stanley Johnson, who was drafted eighth? Oh, I absolutely. Think so. yeah. is, is, he, is he better than Mario Hazonia, who was drafted uh, fifth? No. Yep. Is he better than Okafor, who was drafted? Well, you're, not, you're not sure on that? I think he is. I mean, he stepped over Giannis. I don't know anymore. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's a good point. He's got a little, he's got a little of that attitude. I and mean, is he better than Moutier, who was drafted seventh? Yep. So, I mean, yeah, but I mean, Moutier, he's quietly having a pretty nice season. I'm glad that he's somewhat turning it around because he's another guy who a lot of people had high hopes and mm -hmm. was just awful going into this season. No, and that's true. And, and look, he found a better situation. And, and, and I mean, there's some minutes there, but, but I, I guess and everybody's going to mention Booker, who, by the way, if you if you go by just that stat, he's 22nd. Um, and I know, I know people can say, well, he's the third star in that group. He's so bad defensively that I, <laughs> that I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would, would the Heat take him now? Yeah, probably. Um, you know, did he just get paid a ridiculous amount of money? Yes. Does his team lose every game? Yes. Is his defense horrible? Yes. So I'm just trying to put all this into context. Before we carry on with today's edition of the Five Reasons Podcast, I want to tell you about one of the great sponsors in the Five Reasons Sports Network, and that is Doral Toyota, which, like us, is pure South Florida. That's Doral Toyota. We can find all your favorite Toyota models, whether you're looking for a new, used, or certified pre-owned vehicle. Doral Toyota is located at 9775 Northwest 12th Street, just a few blocks from International and Dolphin Malls. Experience the Doral difference, which means four years complimentary maintenance and roadside assistance on all new vehicles. In-house financing is available for credit-related issues. Also, if you mention five reasons, when you call 305-680-1129 or come in the dealership, you work with a dedicated manager, not a salesman. Unlike other dealers, Doral Toyota prides itself on an honest and transparent buying process. That's Doral Toyota, DoralToyota.com, or stop in at 9775 Northwest 12th Street. Vamos, let's go, Doral Toyota. The other thing, though, before we get to Whiteside is, is Dragic, because now the issue is, like, what do you do? Because if you want the ball in Justice's hands 30 to 35 minutes a game, how much is it going to be in Goran's hands? And do you think that that kind of pushes them to move him before the deadline. Are we sure are, are we sure that Justice Winslow as a point guard for 30 to 35 minutes a game is a desired outcome? I feel like okay, so Nakai said that he's a point guard and I think we agree that his ball handling is way above what it what, what a normal 6667 six, six, player is. I think basically if what if the outcome of this road trip is you found your backup point guard and you know how to operate when Goran Dragic isn't in the game that's ideal because i think that's actually one of what been one of the one of the heat's biggest achilles heels for the last year and a half it's been well what happens when goran leaves the game there's no backup point guard we talked about tyler johnson trying to improve his ball handling he never got there josh richardson the same and if Justice Winslow is going to be your backup point guard, then that's perfect. It, it might even allow the Heat to reduce Goran Dragic's minutes load because I feel like 
Goran Dragic is a player, and he's he's. I don't like this label, but he actually probably fits it uh, better than you know. For example, when the when it's starting around with Ryan Tannehill, Ryan Tannehill's taking huge injuries. Uh, Goran Dragic feels a bit more injury prone. That he's always got something bothering him, and so if you can take him down to 28, 29 minutes a game and have Justice Winslow playing that backup role and then playing as a wing, which I think he also can do uh, for the other minutes of the game, I think that's totally fine. Like I I, I don't think that again uh, Alpha three game sample you're going from well we don't have a backup point guard to justice Winslow should be the point guard all the time like I think in the context of the roles of this team justice Winslow is perfectly equipped to take on what Goran Dragic leaves behind and then do a little bit extra after that yeah I I agree with Chris Um, I think the most important thing for this team is that now there's clarity when it comes to who's leading the team at any given moment Um, you know Ethan referenced in the beginning uh, of the podcast Uh, how bad the Heat starting lineups have been of late. And a lot of that has to do with, for a while, they were throwing out a Ellington Magruder backcourt where with James Johnson essentially being the only ball handler on the court. And we've all seen how much James Johnson's been struggling since he came back from, from that hernia injury. So I don't know how you can expect the team to play well when you clearly only have two ball handlers on the team. And again, like kind of speaking to Chris's point, I don't think we know for sure what Justice Winslow is going to be moving down the line. But I think we've seen enough to give this 22-year-old the chance to kind of show what he has and, and give him the opportunity to take the, to take the keys and, and really drive this team where he can take it. All right, let's switch to the, the sort of the elephant in the room here. Um, <laughs> because uh, this team has been a hell of a lot of fun to watch the last three games. I mean, just has. I, I mean, there's there's no way around it. I mean, they've been worth staying up for. I mean, they had two big wins. Now, one of them was against, again, the only team in the Western Conference that's tanking, and they, they weren't playing their two best players in, in Booker and Warren. So I don't want to look too much into that. But that win against the Clippers was convincing. That Clippers team has been playing way above its heads, but they have been playing well, and, and the Heat dominated, uh, particularly the fourth quarter of that game defensively. And then I thought they played a very solid game uh, yesterday. Yes, there were some turnovers, there were some mistakes late, but I thought they played well. I thought they did a good job on LeBron or as well as you can do on him when he's shooting like that from the outside. And they're just playing free, they're playing fun. And and the biggest thing that, that I take from it is, Chris, you kind of alluded to this, like watching Bam play, it's constant motion. It's just he's he's always on the move. Okay, whether it's 18 feet from the basket or going to the rim, there's you there's never a time that you're watching Bam and you're like, man, he dogged it on that play. He's pushing other guys to run. In fact, I have felt that he's pushed Goron to run a little bit more when they've been out there together. Because Chris, you and I had Goron on the podcast before the year, and he frankly admitted he didn't really want to run as much as he wanted as he used to. Right? Like he always used to want to push, 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 and now he hasn't. And I feel like just Bam being on the floor has done that. And the other thing is, if you just look at their numbers right now, just from a straight net rating perspective or offensive rating, defensive rating, Kelly Olynyk has been one of their best players, and. The way, for, for, in my opinion, for Linux to continue to be one of their best players is to be playing a lot of five. And so that means, or playing with Bam, and I don't really care who the five is in that particular situation because that's been one of their best lineups. But you look at their best offensive ratings on the team. It's Dragic, Wade, Olenek, Richardson, and then Winslow. And their best defensive ratings are out of bio by a, by a landslide. Uh, Olenek, Winslow, Tyler, and Richardson. So what you see on there are the three kids. Okay, you see a little bit of Wade and Dragic. You see Olenek. You don't see Whiteside. How would you handle the Whiteside situation from a basketball perspective? And how much of what we're seeing, Christian, of the last three games is just him not being there? I think that second question is, is a much more loaded question than the first. But it actually, I mean, I've been thinking lately, especially after uh, Rohan, Rohan Nedkarni um, at Sports Illustrated, he had a chance to interview Justice over the offseason, and he he posted on Twitter some of the quotes that, that he got from him uh, again yesterday. And one, of the, one of the questions that he asked him is, you know, he, he asked, the Heat had played really well when you, Josh Richardson, and Bam Adebayo had shared the court. What's the secret to the success there? The first thing he responds with is, really enjoying your teammates and really getting along with your teammates goes a long way. <laughs> now, he, 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 went, he went on to clarify that there's nobody on the team that he doesn't like, but... That is a very, very particular message to follow up that question. And sometimes, and again, kind of going back to the psychology of these, of these young athletes, 
you know, I don't think we can underestimate how the value of playing with two of your best friends and the trust and confidence that goes along with that. And maybe even the ease of mind or, I mean, again, those are the things that we don't, we can't quantify, but I think it's, it's really interesting. And I think obviously with Hassan not there, you're going to see a lot more BAM. And I mean, we're, we're all watching these games. BAM is just on a completely different level. There's a reason why Alonzo Mourning believes that he's the most talented player on the roster right now. Yeah, and I feel like his development has been uh, something that's been absolutely massive for the Heat. And while I, I do I do kind of place a ceiling on it, like I, I don't think he's going to end up being like a top five center just because I don't think he has the offensive game for it. He might have the offensive game for it. I watched him. I watched him last night confidently step step into an eighteen footer and make it. Like he has a lot of the elements that again, if they appeared more consistently, you would believe that he could be a top ten center in the NBA. Which again, you're picking in the in the late lottery. That's as ideal as it's going to be. And why on draft night I wasn't totally out on the pick. I think a lot of people were because it's like. Hang on, we have Whiteside. We just collided, we we just committed a lot of money to Olenek. What are we doing drafting another big man when you can really only play one at a time? But that that still is the point, by the way. Like I still do kind of understand that criticism because you can only play well. Olenek and Bam play well together, but uh, but Bam and Whiteside do not play well together, and so. I, I just wonder how you're going to allocate all these minutes from a basketball point of view. It's Whiteside has to play fewer minutes, Olenek has to play fewer minutes, and they basically have to play those three players on, on level pegging with what's the max they can all play, like 22 minutes, 24 minutes? And I think it really is a solution that makes nobody happy. I think the best case scenario is you find a trade partner for Hassan, um, and you even if it's a salary, like I think at this point, given what the Heat have looked like without him, I'm okay if you don't get very much back in return, if you're not getting an asset back in return. If the best you're doing is uh, maybe an expiring contract or you know, maybe you, know, you trade him to Milwaukee for George Hill or something like that and you can end up waiving George Hill next year, like just something that is, is, is a low-burden asset or something that maybe allows you to get some cap relief. Like cap relief might be better at this point than Hassan Whiteside playing instead of Bam Adebayo. Bam Adebayo is the future of this team at center. And I, I think we can, we can pretty clearly say that Hassan Whiteside is not. And so I do think that the answer comes from outside means. With it's getting rid of us on white side for for what? Like it doesn't have to be a lot. Like if another team wants to, you know, give it a go and and give up a, a low level asset for him, like I think the Heat should be okay with taking that. I think they are okay with taking that. Um, I, I think they just haven't found it. <laughs> I, are you, you know, sure? Like, do we yeah. think because because ultimately it's Pat's decision? Do we think that Pat Riley is all the way out? I, I don't. I think, well, I think I don't, he, like if there would be somebody in the organization that would be the last vestige of let's try make it work with Whiteside. It would be Pat Riley, wouldn't it? But now, but here's what's different. I think Bam has shown he can be it, right? Sure. So Pat has his big. Okay, like I, I, I don't I don't feel I don't feel like he's going to hang on for dear life. It's too obvious now. OK, it's too obvious. The team looks like it's having fun. I think what you mentioned with Winslow and this friendship thing with Bam is instructive. You know, when I was around them a lot that first year, Winslow, you know, hung out with with Hassan a little bit. I don't see much of that anymore on social media, right? Like I'm not around the team like I was around the team that year. I was with them every day. I don't see that. OK, and to me. Just knowing Justice's personality a little bit, getting to know him that first year, he's not the type to tolerate bullshit. He's just not like he does. He does. He doesn't tolerate bullshit questions. He's got a very serious attitude about things. I mean, he bonded with Amari Stoudemire the year they were together over art. OK, he's 20 at the time. All right. <laughs> OK, I mean, I, I just I, I don't I mean, is is I mean, if he's someone who bonds with Stoudemire, is he going to have a connection with Whiteside? I mean, is that is that that doesn't that seems incongruous to me. I mean, I think they did a little bit at first. We were trying to put them together because they were playing off the bench together. Remember that first year a little bit when Hassan came back and Hassan played really well for five or six weeks. I just don't see that as a as a long term uh, kind of fit personality wise, whereas Bam, anybody you talk to in the organization, anyone. OK, I on draft night, I talked to somebody who was very involved in the researching of Bam, and they were like, we found nothing, no issues whatsoever. He's a perfect Heat player. That's what they said on draft night. That's how they sold it. And that's what he is, okay? He runs, he works, okay? I, I just, I, to me, I'm with you. They have to move Hassan at this stage for anything, because here's the other thing. We know how Eric felt about this last year, okay? <laughs> right? We know how Eric felt about this. And Let's be honest, Eric Spolster, not Pat Riley, is the future of your organization 
in terms of decision making, right? Or at least he's a bigger part of the future long term. They have to clean this up, all right? They have to move us on somewhere. And I don't think I don't think it's been from lack of trying. I mean, he was involved in the Minnesota deals. I, I just think it's from lack of interest. And the one thing that's driven me crazy has been this attitude that some Heat fans have had, like, well, you've got to play Hassan and Dion and Tyler Johnson and James Johnson to raise their value. Every GM in the league is an idiot? Like, I, yeah. like what? Because they have a good week. Now, to me, it's different if Bam Adebayo or Justice Winslow have a good week and they look like they're emerging because they're parts of the future. But like there's and there's not as much of a sample size with them. Right. So but at this point, like, don't we know what James Johnson is? Don't we know pretty much what Dion Waiters is? Don't we know what Hassan Whiteside is? Don't don't we know what Tyler Johnson is? I would disagree. You, I would disagree on Dion just because he hasn't played for a year and a half. Healthy. I don't. Is he still on the team? Okay. I look. <laughs> I, I I mean. I mean. Serious. I mean. It was his birthday yesterday. They were all wishing him a happy birthday. I'm like, okay. But I mean, is he coming back? Is he? Do they want him back? I, I'm not even sure. But. Uh, to me, like playing those guys does not make sense just to raise value. I mean, this idea of raising value, it, it, it a good week of Hassan, like being committed to it. I mean, the whole thing is he looked committed early in the season and that was great and great credit to him. And then it kind of turned back into what it was. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to do that every time. So that, that's sort of uh, my view in it. I want to tell you about another great event we're having for the Five Reasons Sports Network. And to me, this is our coolest event yet because this is the one that you can involve your kids in. You're not just watching the game. You're also watching them play. It's going to be at Gecko Parks in Weston. That's 3305 Corporate Avenue in Weston. This is a brand new facility. I've been there a bunch of times. My daughter loves to go. I feel like she's at a birthday party there every week because when parents come and see the place, they're like, yeah, this is the place we're going to have a birthday party. They've got trampolines. They've got dodgeball. They've got basketball. They've got games. They've got ropes course. They've got virtual reality now too. They've got great pizza and wings. And also they have rock climbing. And here's the deal. If you show up anytime between 12 and four, this is on Sunday, the 16th, this upcoming Sunday, show up and say five reasons, buy a day pass and you will get free rock climbing against your child. This is a $20 value. You can challenge your child, do whatever you want to do. It's going to be a great time. So we'll have all the games on Sunday ticket, Dolphins, Vikings, Gecko Parks in Weston. This is the five reason sports network, Miami sports on demand. We now have 15 podcasts in the network covering every professional sports team in South Florida and much more, all absolutely free. Find all of our shows on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Podbean. If you just can't get enough, become a member of our patron feed and you'll get even more exclusive content. Here's a sneak peek of what you'll hear on the upcoming episode of our newest show, The Chamber Podcast. We're now joined by Dr. Peter Marciante. There's a local sports team down here hampered by injuries right now. The team is ravaged by injuries. How much do you put of that into the training staff and the physical therapist? Unfortunately, I put a lot on it. Now what they've done is they've, they've blocked out all external doctors to have total control, and I'm not sure it's working that well but there needs to be a little more freedom and guys need to be also take charge in, in their own health care they can't just go to a team who's trying to manage 100 players if you're interested in advertising your business on any of our podcasts reach out to us at number five reason sports on twitter to stay up to date with all of our shows enter five reasons in your search bar and then hit subscribe I know we need to close. I, I want to get to uh, to this a little bit. Do you have a couple of numbers, Christian? I, one thing that sort of got, caught my attention was when Chris was talking about the Olenek, uh bam combination. Do you have anything on that or anything on sort of the kids playing with Wade that kind of speaks to, to where this group is right now? Yeah, I mean, I actually have a, have a little bit of both. I did want to touch on one thing, uh, just going back to that conversation you guys were having. Um, I, I The Heat definitely have a hard choice ahead of them with Hassan, but – if they can't get anything of value back, they cannot attach a draft pick just to get rid of him. I mean, w look at the last three picks Miami's had, and they haven't had many in the last few years, but they've gotten great value out of all of them. They have to start trusting their scouting. And I know that Pat Riley said that he doesn't believe in the draft, but he's got great scouts who are getting him great players, and he's got to embrace that. And, and I would it's a hope great that, player development team too. Exactly, and I would hope that they would take a lot of these contracts and try to at least get some you know, a couple second round picks we don't have it's been years since we had second round picks you know they, they need to start looking to to turn some of these guys that they build up and getting value back from them 
Um, but anyway, yeah. So going back to uh, to Alinek and and Bam, I mean, obviously the combination that that's been huge of late has been them two with with Justice. And so far this season, in 118 minutes, they're plus 63. So if you do some rough math, I mean, here, let me bust out a calculator real quick. Uh, <laughs> I knew this was coming. Uh, I, I got, we got almost to the end of the episode. I was going to put this on a poll. Do you think they'll get to the end of the episode, the two of these guys, without calculators and spreadsheets? Oh, no. I, no. I almost if, if, made if, it. If you don't think don't. we got to this segment of the program and you say, hey, do you guys have numbers for us? And I, don't, I didn't pull up a spreadsheet with, uh, with any number of different stats. You are insane. Yeah, I mean, so just quick math. That means that that um, Winslow Olenek Adebayo grouping has been outscoring opponents by 19 points per 36 minutes. I mean, they're they're blowing teams out of the water. Albeit, a lot of those lineups have been against bench units, but there's been a lot of overflowing in starters as well. Um, you know, after a while, when you have that kind of data, you have to start embracing it, and that's why it's it's been nice to see what's been happening on this road trip. Now, for me, the thing that, that I kind of find interesting as it relates to uh, – so basically what I wanted to do last night, I went uh, across the NBA.com slash stats page and basically tried to figure out, you know, where, where the Heat are sort of towards the top and the bottom of the league in. Uh, one, one area that I found really interesting that kind of doesn't really add up. So the Heat – uh, in terms of percentage of points that come from threes, are actually fourth in the league. Thirty-four. This is by the way before last night, so I haven't I haven't checked the numbers uh, since. But uh, before last night, thirty-four percent of their threes, thirty-four uh, percent of their points came from threes, and thirty-seven point seven, thirty-seven point five percent of their three point uh, of their field goal attempts have come from three. So they're taking a lot of threes. They're actually kind of more in the mold of Mori Ball uh, in terms of taking a lot of threes. And yet, their effective field goal percentage and true shooting percentage is towards the bottom of the league. They're 26th in both of those areas. So they're taking a lot of threes. But I, I feel like Eric Spolster is trying to play a pace and space kind of offense. They're 10th in the league in pace, which, by the way, is generally not in keeping with where the Heat have been uh, under Eric Spolster. They've actually been kind of a middle of the pack to lower end of the pack uh, team in terms of pace. They're 10th in they're tenth in pace. They're taking a lot of threes. They're driving towards the rim a lot. And yet, they haven't been very efficient. And so so what it sort of signals to me is that Eric Spolster is trying to, with this roster, uh, get shooting where there is no shooting. And I feel like that right now it might be among the bigger Achilles heels uh, of, of this roster build is that there just isn't enough shooting on it. And so Eric Spolster is trying to make something of it and trying to basically turn guys into shooters that just aren't. And so that for me is kind of the fascinating thing going on with the team right now. When you look at it from a broader perspective is that they are trying to take a ton of threes. They're trying to play in the modern mold of basketball. They're just not very good at it. Well, yeah. what they've also decided too, guys, is not to play um, you know, a lot, at least uh, he didn't play at all last night, to play their best shooter, right? Because, I mean, Wayne Ellington's numbers across the board, and I know you've done some numbers on this, Christian, of how they're using Ellington this year, which has been strange and made you think, and I think, that they might be tanking. They might be doing this on purpose. <laughs> because, because Wayne went from a guy who was one of their best on-off guys last year to he's their worst isn't he other than Derek Jones Jr. who's gotten a little bit better lately like Wayne's numbers are are horrible but you've kind of found the reason for that yeah I mean it's 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 a little I mean they're they've been playing him a lot almost as like a point guard um and it's it's also that he's he's not playing much with Kelly Olenek either last last season they were one of the, I believe they were the best two man combination on the team when it came, when it came to plus minus, and he's spending a lot more time this season on the court with Hassan Whiteside than he is with Kelly Olynyk. Um, I don't I'm not going to sit here and say that that's the reason why his play is slipping. He's not shooting as well as he was last year. I think he's sitting like around 36 percent this season. But I mean, the team has been a huge minus with him on the court. Obviously, he's not a good defender. And it's it's it got exposed when they faced Philadelphia in the playoffs last season. And I think that's kind of carried over. He, he really can't get around screens. You know, if, if you just force him to chase a guy around the court, he's most likely going to end up getting lost at least enough to leave an open shot. It's I mean, it, it's it's a problem with Wayne. Um, you know, he's an elite offensive talent. But if you can't maintain yourself on the other side of the court, you're going to especially on a team with so many capable players. You're going to lose your playing time. Yeah, and we are four days away as we record this uh, from the date that they can trade him. 
And I'm just wondering if that's a direction that they go. I also think um, the Magruder minutes lately have just been too much. Um, you know, I mean, I think I think Rodney, we're starting to see it tail off a little bit where he's just worn down. I, I felt he was kind of unplayable against the Lakers. Then he was put out there again late. But again, these are roster decisions that are going to have to get made. But I think the biggest takeaways from the road trip so far Winslow's emergence. Uh, we didn't really get to Josh Richardson in this, but he's had a bit of a of a struggle of late. And again, I think maybe Justice is emerging as maybe more of the alpha personality of the two. And obviously, Bam uh, without Whiteside. You can follow Christian Hernandez at the Maple Rick with his calculator. You can follow Chris Whittingham <laughs> with his spreadsheet at Chris Whittingham. Also, check out the next episode of Miami Heat Beat and on our Patreon feed. We have been doing uh, recaps of every game. So there's there's one from me. There's one from Alf. Uh, there's also one from Johnny, which was done uh, last night off the Laker game. We're doing them throughout. So check that out. You can only get that through Podbean. It's $3 per month, but we're doing a lot more commentaries there. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to the Fire in the Podcast. Thank you so much.